last time we met here, we talked about potential energy for springs, um, which is kind of an odd kind of potential energy. And uh, in lab, you're applying that this week to, to analyze uh, energy dissipation, which is one of the topics of today's lecture. So let's, before we uh, get started on that, let's review briefly <coughs> some things about so we have four possible potential energy graphs here. Gra potential energy is a function of distance. Um, and the question is, which of these graphs shows the appropriate potential energy curve for two, a system of two interacting electrons? So if you don't know, if you're not sure, talk to your neighbor for a second, and then. <laughs> All right, so what do you think? Okay, well that's fairly impressive. Most of you are saying two, which is correct. Um, because two electrons repel each other, <coughs> so uh, you have to put energy into the system to get them close together, uh, and um, four is not the right answer. Uh, what what is what is for what is what is that potential energy grip? Yeah, that's that's the spring potential energy, isn't it? For for uh, compressing and stre energy stored in a string when it's compressed or stretched, where where the x-axis is really stretch in that case, basically, of the spring. Okay. Um, which graph is the closest to the potential energy of a system of two atoms that are bonded together like O2 or CO or something like that, two atoms in an N2, a diatomic molecule? <coughs> which of these graphs is, is the, the best representation of potential energy for that system? So what's the answer? Okay, so we have some disagreement here. Uh, so four is indeed um, four is indeed the potential energy graph for an ideal spring, meaning one that can be stretched infinitely and compressed infinitely, right? But it's not really a representation, uh, an ac accurate representation of what happens with a diatomic molecule because consider two atoms bonded together. <coughs> the bond is spring-like up to a point, but when these atoms start to get really close together, the repulsion gets really strong. We've got interpenetrating electron clouds, uh, and so at that point, the 
it gets harder and harder and harder to push them closer and closer together and it it gets very steep um, there are some uh, in this graph there's sort of no bound states in a certain sense um, but we know that two atoms bound together you have to put in energy to separate them so therefore there better be a situation where k plus u can be negative here and as you separate the atoms farther and farther and farther eventually you just break the bond <laughs> right so we actually wrote a funny looking equation for that which we don't need to know it's called the Morse potential energy and it's a the key is that down in this area with small small stretches or small compressions it's quite parabolic so it is very spring-like in this area but if you extend if you go past this small stretch or small compression regime uh, or parabolic you get huge repulsion here and it eventually the force gets the bond breaks so so this is a better representation of the potential energy in a in a chemical bond <coughs> all right last question interaction of the moon and the earth now presumably we're not actually going to move closer to the earth or move it farther from the earth but if we did what would the potential energy curve look like <laughs> Okay, so what's the, okay, what's your answer? One, one is correct. And so, um, so basically we have to put, if the system has A certain amount of energy here we'd have to put energy in to get them farther apart so they're they're attracted and so to separate them we'd have to put energy into the system here uh, the two electrons want to be far apart because they repel each other and this goes along with the equations that we have for these potential energies so the gravitational potential energy remember was a minus gm1 m2 over the magnitude of R and this quantity is negative um, the electric potential energy was a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 q2 over R and it could be either negative or positive depending on the signs of the charged particles so if we have two electrons we have a negative charge and a negative charge negative times negative is positive and so that that's a positive potential energy corresponding to repulsion if we had a proton and electron this product would be negative and we get we get a graph like that okay <coughs> all right so um, <coughs> So we've been edging up here to talking about uh, the energy of systems that we can't represent as point particles or that it doesn't make sense to represent as point particles and systems that can be stretched or compressed or deformed or can rotate or whatever um, have kinds of energy that we can't we haven't we haven't yet 
exactly captured. So think about a simple example. Think about a Frisbee. So you throw a Frisbee. <coughs> so it's got kinetic energy traveling through the air, right? A half mv squared. But it's also spinning. So isn't there some addi shouldn't there be some additional kinetic energy associated with it, the, the particles, the atoms moving around? The answer is yes. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is what we're going to call internal energy, energy that's not just rest energy or kinetic energy or potential energy, but in energy that's sort of internal to a system. Um, so uh, internal energy is a funny kind of a a catch word uh, and sometimes we use it to mean kinds of energy we don't want to resolve right now so we'll lump it all into internal energy um, but there are lots of different um, so it could be energy associated with vibrations of masses on springs or atoms bonded to each other so we could write vibration <coughs> and vibrational energy really has two parts right because there's a kinetic energy part and a potential energy part so that uh, it could be associated with rotation um, it could be uh, energy associated that's stored as chemical energy like in a living organism so it could be chemical energy the energy you stored up by eating breakfast this morning if you did <laughs> um, and it could be energy just associated with the random motions of of atoms and inside an object so where are we here so remember our ball spring model of a solid with this added twist that uh, those atoms really aren't quite fixed in one place. They're always moving around a little bit, stretching and compressing the chemical bonds. Um, and this is pretty random. There, any given atom can be moving in any direction at any time. And it's that random atomic motion inside a solid or in a liquid, the atoms are still, or molecules are still moving around in a liquid. Um, in a gas, they're moving around a lot. Uh, and so this, this energy we call thermal energy and that suggests something to do with temperature and that's basically correct because uh, this energy is correlated with temperature. Uh, the higher the temperature, the, the more motion there is the more energy there is in this random energy. We'll see in a later chapter that this is temperature is really more correlated with entropy than it is with energy but uh, it's not a bad rule of thumb to just say that the higher the temperature the greater the this random energy which we're going to call thermal energy inside a multi-particle object. <coughs> So, um, so thermal energy is randomized um, randomized internal energy at the micro level.
And because it's randomized, it's sort of hard to, to do anything. Uh, it's, it's not entirely obvious how to make it do something. Like, uh, if all the atoms in the solid were suddenly moving this way, it could push something next to it. But that's not happening. Some of them are moving this way, and some of them are moving that way. So it's, it's kind of hard to extract this energy back out. Um, and what is, what is this thermal energy? Well, in this model, it's not particularly mysterious. It's the kinetic energy of atom 1 plus the kinetic energy of atom 2 plus the kinetic energy of atom 3 plus the potential energy of atoms 1 and 2 interacting plus the potential energy of atoms 2 and 3 interacting. And so if we could measure this for every single atom and every single bond at some instant, we would know the thermal energy, but that's a tough proposition. <laughs> um, so we can use temperature as sort of a rough measure of thermal energy in an object. Um, we use a thermometer to measure temperature. How, how does a thermometer work? So if I wanted to measure the, the temperature of this table, I could, I could put a thermometer in contact with the table. Yes? If I want to measure the temperature of a glass of water, I could put a thermometer in the glass of water. But how does that work? What's going on? Yeah, Jennifer. Um, mercury expands What's heat? So let's talk about it at a micro level. I mean, yes, the, in, a in a thermometer, the mercury, say, say it's a mercury thermometer, you know, the mercury will expand, but things expand when they get hot. How did the mercury get hot? Okay, what's the mechanism for the thermal energy from Let's say I put the thermometer on the table. What's the mechanism for the thermal energy going from the table into the thermometer? It's, it's actually collisions, isn't it? It's, it's these, these atoms on the surface of the table are, are moving in and out, and they're hitting atoms in the glass of the thermometer. And through that collision, they can transfer energy to the glass of the thermometer, and so the atoms in the glass of the thermometer start to vibrate. And then the inner surface of the glass is in contact with the mercury, and so these vibrating glass atoms, silicon atoms, I guess, or oxygen atoms, uh, can collide with a mercury atom and give it energy. So we've got energy flow through basically microscopic work. <laughs> work, at the, work at the atomic level. Um, energy transferred through these collisions. <clears throat> we have a question. Yes. And how does like, one of the like, laser thermometers work? Like one of the one where you would like, point it at an object and it just gives you like, a temperature? Okay, so how do these sensors these sensors work where you don't have contacts. You may have had your temperature taken by someone just putting some, a sensor in your ear briefly or something like that. Um, so it turns out that, and we'll talk about this a little more in chapter 8, and I should explain that we're going to be doing chapters a little bit out of sequence now. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to talk about thermal energy today. Uh, Next time we're going to actually jump to chapter 9 and talk about rotational and vibrational kinetic energy. Um, we will come back to chapter 8 after chapters 10 and 11 because chapter 8 is on energy quantization and we're going to need that we're going to need that in order to talk about entropy and temperature at the at the very end. Um, but basically <coughs> Uh, we find that these vibrations, um, that one way to put energy into vibrations is that uh, 
the object can absorb a photon and that makes it that makes the vibration larger so consider an HCl molecule it's vibrating in comes a photon of appropriate energy it absorbs it and then it's vibrating even more it can also lose that energy by emitting a photon and goes back to vibrating a little bit and those photons are in the range we call infrared and so an infrared detector can pick up that 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 those infrared photons emitted by this this object you're warm <laughs> your atoms are vibrating <laughs> you're emitting infrared photons and so an infrared sensor can actually can pick those up <coughs> now why why would something expand when it gets hot well it actually has to do with this potential energy curve we were looking at a minute ago this Morse potential energy curve so, which looks something like that. <clears throat> so if this was an ideal spring potential energy curve, um, no matter how much what k plus u is here, whether it's this or that, the equilibrium position is still zero stretch. This is an asymmetric curve though it's not entirely a parabola and so down here the equilibrium position would be something like this but if you have a lot of energy in the system the equilibrium position is going to be more like this the equilibrium position is actually farther apart and that means that as more energy more it's spending more time with the atoms farther apart and like Jennifer says it expands as it has greater thermal energy <coughs> um, so just by kind of thinking about this at the microscopic level we can start to understand a lot about energy transfer now um, we, uh, where we're going with this is we're going to do something that some of you have been waiting for. Um, we've written the energy principle a number of ways. One way is to say a change in energy of the system is, is work, is due to work. And we know that's not the only way we can get energy into a system. And so the next thing we're going to add today is symbolized by Q. And we're going to call it uh, energy transfer due to a temperature difference. Um, now we're, we're calling it this to avoid using the word heat. Why are we avoiding using the word heat? Because it just gets misused all the time. It has a weird technical definition. The technical definition is it's an amount of energy transferred into a system. But we use it all the time to mean temperature basically. And that's not what it means. It means energy transferred into a system. So we're just not going to use it at all. We're going to talk about energy transfer into a system due to a temperature difference or thermal energy transfer. Um, that way we won't get into trouble. And we've mentioned some other things. We have energy due to absorbing electromagnetic radiation. Um, we could add chemical energy into the system. We could add lots of things. Okay, so, so basically lots of inputs, but today we're going to focus on energy, energy transfer into a system due to uh, a temperature difference. <coughs> uh, 
Um, ta -da. Uh, let's see. <coughs> okay, so let's see if we know enough now to answer this question. So we have two lead bricks uh, moving toward each other, one in the plus x direction, one in the minus x direction. Uh, each has kinetic energy k. They come, smash into each other and come to a stop. What happened to this energy? So, what happened? Yeah, two is correct. The kinetic energy changed into thermal energy, so random, lots of random motion inside the blocks, they, their temperature rose, right? So, okay. Um, now, there's a, there's a, a different, different kinds of materials take different amounts of energy to raise their temperature one degree Kelvin or one degree Celsius, which is the same thing, right? Same distance. Um, and uh, one of the first measurements of this was that it takes 4.2 joules of energy input into a system to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Kelvin. And this is indeed called, uh, there are two words associated with this. Heat capacity means the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a particular object by one degree. So this cup has a particular heat capacity. It would take a certain amount of energy input to raise the temperature of the cup by one degree. We, that's not very useful, so we usually want it on a per gram basis. And so on a per gram basis, it's called specific heat. Um, and so specific heat again, in the alphabet, so we use a capital C is the ratio of the change in thermal energy for an object um, per gram uh, per degree. Uh, so per, per degree. So we, it comes out as joules per gram per Kelvin. So the, the specific heat of water is 4.2 joules per gram to raise the temperature of water one, one degree Kelvin. Um, and so we can use this to calculate how much energy we'd have to put in to raise the temperature of a certain amount of water by a certain amount, right? Yes. But if you happen to have memorized the specific heat of water, you're free to use all the significant figures you want. <laughs> um, it isn't going to make very much 
it isn't going to we, we typically are giving you constants to two significant figures because what we care about is the principle and not not an engineering calculation of exactly how much energy you'd have to put in but um, yes So, so thermal energy is, um, is the energy associated with, so the question is, is there, is there a difference between the energy transfer associated with vibration and thermal energy? So thermal energy is, so Q is an energy transfer, Q is an energy input. Okay, so this is, a, this is an energy input. And Q can be positive or negative if you're putting energy into a system um, Q is positive if the system is if energy is leaving the system due to a temperature difference Q is negative <coughs> um, but so what is thermal energy it's that energy associated with random motion of atoms and it has two components so one is the kinetic energy of these moving atoms and the other is the the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds, so this, this spring potential energy associated with the chemical bonds. So it's that K plus U at the micro level that we're calling thermal energy, and it's randomly distributed throughout the object. <coughs> okay, so suppose you um, you took an insulated jar of water, you had 500 grams of water, shook it vigorously sideways 500 times, moving at a meter in each direction. <laughs> okay, what would the temperature increase of the water be? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's an interesting one. So. <coughs> So, <coughs> so, so how do we think about this? Okay, so we're not talking about energy input here, right? We're talking about energy input due to some mechanical work, basically. So we can calculate the change in the energy of the system due to the work we do. And then if we say, and all that energy went into internal energy in the water, then we should be able to calculate the delta T, right? So let's, let's see what we can do. Work is equal to, let's see, we have to know how big a force you're exerting uh, to move this thing sideways. Uh, um, well, let's say you're, for, you're exerting a force mg on it, okay? Um, so, so it's F x the force you exert to the distance and you do this 500 times but you do it up and back so it's times 2 and uh, So let's say, <coughs> you of 0.5 kilograms times 10 newtons per kilogram over a distance of one meter times 500 times 
times 2, which gives us 5 times 500 is 2,500 times 2 is, you did 5,000 joules of work. Does it matter in the direction you're doing it? Well, okay, it doesn't matter the direction. Let's think about work. Okay, so I'm shaking this, I'm accelerating it this way, exerting a force in the direction of motion, and then I'm moving it back the other way, exerting a force the other way in the direction of motion. So I'm doing positive work in both cases because, yes? Oh, there's a two. Let's see. Let's see, 0 0.5 times 10 is 5, times 500 is 2,500, right? What? Like, 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 Sorry. <laughs> okay, 500, so uh, uh, water is a gram per milliliter. So, okay, 5,000 joules. Um, and now we can use this equation, right? So we have uh, <coughs> Delta T is equal to delta E thermal uh, over of mass times C. So that's 5,000 joules divided by, and this is, uh, we have this as 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin. So we better have the mass in grams. So this is. 5,500 grams, 10 divided by 4.2 is what, 2 point something, uh, 2.4. <clears throat> so you raise the temperature of the water by doing that 2.5 degrees. Yes? to convert joules to Kelvin or Celsius? Um, no, because they're different animals. I mean, temperature is, temperature is indeed, does reflect in internal energy. Okay, so it reflects thermal energy. But it's a change in temperature, if you know the specific heat of something, can tell you a change in thermal energy. Notice we never did calculate the amount of thermal energy in the water. All we did is calculate the change in thermal energy in the water. <coughs> yes? Okay, so the question is, if you're doing a homework problem and it's asked for degrees Celsius, do you have to convert Celsius to Kelvin? Um, here, it doesn't matter, right? Because this is a temperature difference. This is a T1 minus T2 minus T1. And a Celsius degree and a Kelvin degree are the same amount. It's just there's this offset, this minus 273 point whatever, okay? If you're actually converting a temp 
temperature. If you're doing a temperature, you have to do it in Kelvin, and we'll do that right now <coughs> in a minute. Um, okay, so what we want is... <coughs> okay, we've got a pot that has a thousand grams of water. You've got it over a campfire. You're also stirring the water with a paddle. So the water's the system. Uh, the fire's at a higher temperature than the water. There is this energy temp transfer due to a temperature difference. And so that's a, that's a Q of 5,000 joules to the water due to the fire. At the same time, because you're stirring it, you're doing work on the water and so you do 2,000 joules of work. <coughs> so what's the increase in the thermal energy of the water? So this is an easy question. I'm not asking you for a temperature. I'm asking you. <laughs> okay. All right. So the answer is the answer is indeed five. So it's it's change in the energy of the system is work done by the surroundings on the system. That would be U. And energy transfer due to a temperature difference between the fire and the water. That's Q. And so. <laughs> So we add them together, 5,000 plus 2,000 gives us 7,000. Okay? So, so this leads us um, to, wait a minute, what is this? This leads us to this question. <coughs> Are Q and delta E thermal the same thing? Is that a six? It says, I'm going with three. <laughs> Can Wolverine control the number of talents he extends? He only has three. Oh, he only has three. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be kind of weird. It's like, give me a hundred. He's got a fourth one coming out over the side. His entire hand is just one spike. <laughs> All right, so what's the answer? It's three. Okay. Yeah, so. So this is, this is something that sometimes is confusing, um, but, uh, but just be a little careful about it. So we saw in the previous problem that, uh, that there's more than one way to increase the thermal energy of the water, one way by stirring. And so even if you are in this problem, we just did work on the water and we increased its thermal energy even though there was no energy transfer due to a temperature difference. So, uh, so delta E thermal can be non-zero even if Q is zero. They're not the same thing. They're not always equal. And they're not always positive. <laughs> so if something gets colder, if uh, you put a hot cup of coffee in the refrigerator, energy is transferred from the coffee to the refrigerator, so Q is negative if you take the coffee as the system. So, okay.
So qu other questions about this? No, okay. So let's get this equation up here so that we can use this board. specific heat is delta E thermal over M delta T. So let's consider another example. <coughs> Suppose we have a 300 gram block of aluminum <coughs> whose temperature is 500 Kelvin. <coughs> And we have, uh, let me get the numbers right, a 650-gram block of iron whose temperature is initially 300 Kelvin. <coughs> and we put them together uh, in an insulated styrofoam cooler. So, in the insulated enclosure, <coughs> what's the final? We put them so they're touching and we insulate it so it's not exposed to. Okay? And we want to find out what the final temperature is going to be. Now, at this temperature, specific heat actually uh, at low temperatures is a well, at any temperature, it's a function of temperature. But at this um, the specific heat of aluminum is about one uh, joule per gram per Kelvin, and the specific heat of iron is about 0 0.42 joules. So after a while they get to the same temperature, and this is actually sort of a profound law of thermodynamics, kind of the, I think it's called the zeroth law, you, there will be a thermal equilibrium uh, established. So what's, what's the temperature? Think about it for just a minute. So can we use the energy principle to solve this problem? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay, how would you like to do it? <laughs> okay, so what are we choosing as the system? Okay, the system is both blocks. So we have change in energy of the system is work plus 
energy transfer due to a temperature difference with the surroundings. There is no work done. There's no... So that says the total energy of the system, the change of total energy of the system has to be zero. But energy could flow within the system from one block to the other block, right? Well, so that means that the, the change of thermal energy for the aluminum plus the change of thermal energy for the iron have to add up to zero, right? <coughs> so we've got the mass of the aluminum times the heat capacity, the specific heat of the aluminum times delta T for the aluminum plus the mass of the iron times the specific heat of the iron times delta T <coughs> zero. <coughs> but these are these delta T's aren't equal, are they? No. Not necessarily. But we can rewrite this a little bit in a way that makes it easier. So we can say mass of aluminum C aluminum T final minus whatever temperature it equilibrates to finally minus its initial temperature, which was 500 Kelvin, right? <coughs> Plus mass of the iron, specific heat of iron, T final minus 300 Kelvin, and this is equal to zero. <coughs> and now we do have equation we can solve for T final, right? <coughs> yes? Why were we able to start with both blocks of the system and then kind of break them up into two different systems? So the question is why were we able to start with both blocks of the system but then break them up into two different systems? Um, we can choose anything we want as a system, right? So choose two blocks. We didn't break it up into two different systems. It's, uh, um, it's sort of the same as if you had two stars orbiting each other, the kinetic, the sum of their Ks plus the potential energy would be a constant, but energy can flow from one to the other. So so the change in energy of star one has to be, okay? So we're, we're not breaking it up into two separate systems, we're just saying they're two components of the same system. They're two pieces of the same system and energy can flow within the system. <coughs> and so if we plug in all the numbers, which we know from over here, uh, So, <coughs> we have 300 grams times one joule per gram per Kelvin times T final minus 500 Kelvin plus, uh, what was it, 650 grams times 0 0.5. Per Kelvin times T final minus 300 Kelvin equals zero, and we solve for T final, and we get so what range is this number going to be in? What's, what's the highest it could possibly be, and what's the lowest it could possibly be? <coughs> it's going to be somewhere between 300 and 500, isn't it? I think it comes out to 429.
So if you did take one block as the system, if you took the aluminum block as the system, it, it lost thermal energy. And that means for that system, Q would be negative if you took it as a, okay? <coughs> All right. So this was a situation where the system came to <laughs> equilibrium. So there was no energy flow, but there's a different, so eventually there was no net flow of energy from one block to the other. There's another situation called a steady state. Um, there is energy flow, but um, but the amount of thermal energy in the system doesn't change. So an example of that could be you're, you're heating a house, using energy to heat the house, but the house isn't all that well insulated, and so energy leaves the house and heats the air around the house. At a certain point, you reach a steady state where the, house, the temperature of the house isn't changing, so the thermal energy of the house isn't changing, but you're still putting energy in by burning natural gas, and you're still losing and energy's flowing out to heat the air, and so that's a steady state. <coughs> we can talk in a situation like this about power, and here power is defined as energy per unit time. Uh, in this case it would be joules over seconds and one joule per second is one watt. So that's a unit of power. So how much energy does it take to run a 100 watt light bulb for an hour? So how do we calculate the amount of energy needed to run a 100 watt light bulb for an hour? Dimensional analysis is your friend. <laughs> so we want, if 100 watts is joules per second, <coughs> so So what do we multiply to get joules? Seconds. So 60 seconds per minute times 60 minutes per hour. So 
So, yes, so that's 3,600 seconds, so this is 3.6 times 10 to the fifth joules. What? You right? Is it? I only off that couple of sick things. <laughs> okay. And the light bulb itself is is what we call an open system. It's in the it's in the steady state. So you're putting energy in to run an electric current through a very thin filament in this incandescent light bulb. This is why we don't have them anymore. <laughs> they use a lot of energy. And, uh, and its energy is flowing out of the light bulb in the form of, of photons, some of which are visible and some of which are in the infrared. You can feel it. It's hot. So you have infrared detectors in your skin. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so do you have questions about this? All right, I want to try a series of questions um, analyzing uh, a particular situation. So we have a horse running up a hill. <coughs> horse is running with constant speed up a long hill of height h, uh, horizontal extent d, so um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a physics diagram of the situation. It's running at constant speed V. Okay. Um, and let's start by choosing the horse as the system. <coughs> and start from the energy principle. So we're going to start from change of energy of the system is work plus energy transfer due to a temperature difference. And we're going to work on the right-hand side of the equation. So <coughs> what are the objects in the surroundings that exert forces on the horse? So we're working on work here, obviously. So we're going to calculate work. So what's the objects in the surroundings that? So what are the objects in the surroundings that exert forces on the horse? Three, yes, three, good. Three, the earth, the ground, ground, air resistance is probably not a big deal. If it's Okay, so how much work is done by the ground? Now, the, it, the horse's hooves are not slipping. So how much work is done by the ground, meaning the surface he's running on, or she, it? The surface it is running on. <coughs> Three. 
So how much work is done by the ground? <laughs> is it positive, negative, or zero? <laughs> okay, well there's a few brave people who are answering three and, and they're correct. Um, and remember <laughs> that work is force times displacement, but the displacement is the displacement of the point where the force is applied. And the ground is indeed applying a force to the horse's foot, just as it applies a force to your foot when you walk. And in fact, if it didn't apply a force in the forward direction, you wouldn't be able to go forward. <laughs> um, but that point doesn't move. So the work done by the ground is zero. <laughs> right? What's the work done by the gravitational force uh, exerted by the Earth? Okay, so what's the answer? Yes, three, good. So, so the work done by the earth <coughs> zero work done by the earth is a minus mgh <coughs> and So now, the, when the horse started running, the horse, it got hot, uh, and then it temperature leveled off, so it's hot, still running. <coughs> What's the deal with Q here? Is Q positive, negative, or zero? Well, think about the situation. So the horse is hotter than the air, right? Yeah. And what's the definition of Q? Energy transferred due to a temperature. Energy transfer due to a temperature difference. Due to a temperature difference, and our system is the horse. So is the horse? So there is a temperature difference between the horse and the air, right? So Q is not zero. <laughs> so is it positive or negative? Q is negative because the horse is hotter than the air. So energy, air, energy is flowing from the horse to the air. Yeah, so there is a point to this. I mean, paying attention to signs of things is actually makes sense, okay? <coughs> Okay, so we get to a steady state, um, and so it's written here, this is equal to a, a minus mgh and a minus the absolute value of q just to emphasize that, that this term is negative, okay? So... So, it looks like no energy is being put into the system. Energy is leaving the system. So what energy terms do we need to think about for the horse? Now 
Remember that our system is the horse. Okay, I'm hearing interesting conversations. <laughs> okay, fingers, let's vote. Okay, we've got threes and fours. So, uh, why is four not the right answer? <laughs> because there's only one object in the system. So there can't be, that's right, so there, there is no potential energy term, so... Now, the rest energy of the horse doesn't change. Does the horse's kinetic energy change? So we're considering, once the horse gets going, so there's a tiny change here, but that it gallops up at constant speed, is its kinetic energy changing? Is the horse's thermal energy changing? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is its temperature changing? <laughs> Again, there's an initial transient where it gets hot, but then it's galloping up the hill and its temperature is constant. So what's changing? Yeah, so we have <coughs> chemical energy change. <laughs> and that makes sense. The horse has to expend energy to gallop up this hill. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Is the change in the horse's chemical energy positive or negative? Negative, right. Because, because <clears throat> it's it's burning up the chemical energy. It's using the chemical energy it got from eating all those great oats in the morning. So this is less than zero. All right. So negative work done by the earth, energy transfer from the hot horse to the cool air. Okay, what would be different if we chose the whole universe as the system? <laughs> okay, the horse and the earth and the air. How about that? And the ground. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> what happens? Okay, so so what's the deal with the right-hand side if we choose everything as the system? <coughs> Work is zero. Q is zero. <coughs> okay, so what goes on the left-hand side of this equation? Well, okay, so we have a change in kinetic energy plus a change in rest energy plus a change in chemical energy plus 
Okay. Thermal energy. Yeah, is there a potential energy term? Yeah, yep. Yep. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um <coughs> So gravitational potential energy increases as the horse goes up. Okay, the air gets hot. The horse's chemical energy goes down. Rest energy doesn't change. And he's galloping at constant speed. So we've got those. Um, So we've got <coughs> so del change in chemical energy plus the change in thermal energy. And what is what is this algebraically? The change in gravitational potential energy near the Earth's surface here. Plus or minus? Really? Well, is H, Y final is positive, bigger than Y initial. Yeah, so. Well, so, um, remember that change in Potential energy is minus work done by forces internal to the system. And this is an internal force. So we have a zero minus mg zero times zero h minus zero, we'll say zero. So the force is in the minus y direction. The gravitational force does negative work, but it's internal to the system. So we have this minus sign, so therefore it's a plus mgh. <coughs> so it looks like, since we've got an mgh here and an mgh there, we have a delta E chemical So the, the change in the horse's chemical energy is equal to the change in the thermal energy of the air, basically. Would the change in the thermal energy be zero because the horse needs heat, but if it's both the system or the... The horse, the, the change in thermal energy of the, is, of the whole system is not zero. Of course, the horse heats up and then stays at a constant, stays at a constant temperature while he's galloping, so his thermal energy isn't changing, okay? All right. See you in an hour and a half. <coughs>